This is the creation. Can we have the creator coming forward? Yes, so we have a round of applause for the last one. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. Uh, Richard asked me if I would launch his book based on probably the fact that I have known him for at least 2,000 years. <laughs> and I'm sure that many of you know Richard already. Richard was one of the first of the published authors that I became acquainted with back before I was one back in the dawn of time when I was actually frightened of published authors and thought they were different from people who weren't published authors. And I remember we were at a, I think it might have even been at your place, but we were at a barbecue with Rob and some other friends once, and I was really nervous. It was my first time I'd been invited to a published author's house to hang out with published authors. And I remember Bill Condon pointing to the cracks on the cement of the driveway and he looked at me and nudged me and said, Published authors on this side, unpublished authors on that side. <laughs> but I got, I got over my, my, my fear of published authors, and over the years I thought, well, maybe I could be one too and I could catch up. But sadly, I've now come to the realization I will never catch up with Richard. Rich, this is Richard's 17th published book, and I've got one. So, no, Richard. <laughs> you don't know about Richard, so I thought I'd share a few little snippets with you. I might just have to disappear here. <laughs> For example, amongst other things, Richard's father was a banana salesman. You know how some kids deal some, drugs some in the school playground? Well, Richard used to trade stories for lollies with other children in the school playground. Richard claims he had writer's block for 25 years, which is quite good going if you think about it. Yeah. And Richard has a PhD in something called superstructuralism, but I've never asked and I wouldn't recommend you do it. <laughs> um, now, every author, every successful author such as Richard with 17 books, they have to have a particular thing they bring to, to, to the storytelling genres. Because you just don't do 17 books if you don't have anything to say. And I was thinking, what is it about Richard that makes Richard's books so unique? What is it that makes him stand out? And it's actually very clear to me what that is. It's not a mystery at all. Richard has a particular skill, and that is writing the grotesque. <laughs> and Song of the Slums features, my favourite part of Song of the Slums is the children. <coughs> These, there are three incredibly horrible children in this book. They have horrible names, <laughs> Blanket, Presta and Witty and um, they, they are beautifully portrayed and if you, are, if you have children of your own or if you are a teacher or if you just don't like children very much, this is a book for you. If you don't have children it won't encourage you to have Certainly, I, I, yes, because you do not want children like these children. So it's a complex book with many layers, it's an action adventure, it's a romance, it's steampunk, set in the same world as his Liberator and World Shaker books. But I won't crap on and bore you with this anymore, I will throw over to Richard to do as a reading because that's the other thing Richard is known for, his loud booming voice that once you have heard him read, you can't get it out of your head. If you then go on to read his books, he will always narrate them to you. So here we go, go Richard. Okay. I'm going to do a reading which is kind of like crucial to the story. The, the centre of the story is the invention of rock and roll in the middle of the Victorian age. And the slum gangs have their own kind of music which just happens to have a heavy, powerful, driving beat. And one gang leader called Granny Rouse has a vision. She believes if, if she can draw the very best gang musicians together, make the perfect sound, create the perfect band, gang music can take over the world. And that is actually the rest of the story, that's what happens. But at this stage, Astor and Verrill have fled from these industrialist tycoons, and they're in the slums, and they need to join up with a gang. So they have to try out playing music. And Verrill's okay, he can play the clapper and peeler. Astor, she plays the harp. <laughs> you don't really want a harp in a rock and roll band. So she tries out behind the drums, but she's not really confident about it. So here we go. Esther took a seat on the upturned box and stared at the kegs, pipe cans and pots before her. It was impossible. She'd never played percussion in her life. But clearly Vell thought this was her only chance to join the game. 
They all conferred the, with the other musicians. Then came to the men. One, two, three, four. He tapped on the drums to start her off. It was the same rhythm as before, and she took it up, trying to reproduce the same pounding driving quality. The other musicians came in with their savage, half-melodic guitar sounds. Bill danced in front of her, jumping and gyrating, long legs flexing to the beat. Once she had the hang of the drum, she began to experiment with the timbre of different pots and pans, but there was something missing. Put more energy into it, harder, stronger. Fell was almost pleading with her, pay for your life. What more could she do? She saw Granny Rouse shaking her head, and a rage swelled up inside her. Stupid drum, stupid music. She would have shown them how she could really play if she'd had a harp, but the swale kids had destroyed her harp. Stupid, stupid, stupid! The frustration of the moment built up, up on top of all the injustice of the day, on top of all the injustices of the last few weeks. Her pent up feeling became a tidal wave. She might have thrown the drumsticks as far as she could throw them, but instead, she took out her frustration on the drums, beating them, hammering them, battering them. It turned into a delirium, a frenzy, as if we, every keg, pass, pot and pan was the face of an opponent. She just had to hit and hit and keep on hitting. Everything else disappeared into the distance. Strangely though, she never lost the beat. The musician in her still kept the original rhythm, only a hundred times more fierce and savage. Sweat dripped off her face and her hair fell forward over her eyes so she could hardly see. She didn't need to see. Sheer rage possessed her. She was scarcely conscious of the other musicians, except as elements in the storm she created. All sense of time disappeared. She grimaced and grunted meaningless words to herself. It seemed she had barely begun when Vell danced in front of her drums and leaned in until she could no longer ignore him. She couldn't hear, but she could read what he was mouthing. Stop now! Stop! She built the sound up and up and up, bringing in every drum, then concluded with a tremendous final crash. So tremendous that the rebounding drumsticks leapt from her fingers and flew ten feet away. She pushed aside damp strands of her hair. Everyone was goggling at her. The silence was unnerving. She saw the shock in their eyes and wished she could vanish down a hole in the ground. She'd made a complete idiot of herself. She would have had said sorry, but the apology died in her throat. What she'd revealed could never be recalled. She wiped the sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand. She felt utterly exhausted. What did I do? She asked Beryl in an undertone. Have I offended them? Uh, no, he grinned. Stunned them, I think. Two girls from the crowd stepped forward. They caught the drumsticks that had flown from her hands, and now they gave them back to her. That was the best drumming ever, they said. <laughs> Or if you like steampunk, if you like horrible children, or if you just, just like Richard, then maybe you'd like to come and buy the book. And the lovely Richard will sign it for you. So please come and buy the book. I've read it. It's great. Thank you for coming.